At the end of the year 2021, we are seeing noticeable price inflation. Many people also wonder how long it might take for the stock market to take a general dip after it had seen incredible growth over the past two years. Whether it might be for those or other reasons, many people are wondering how they can prepare themselves for a potential financial crisis and some wonder how they can protect their hard-earned savings. Well, I certainly can't give you a direct answer. But what I can tell you is that both useful skills and high quality goods will still have real world value even when your stocks or money might not have any longer. And in that sense, let's try to save some high quality goods and maybe learn some useful skills along the way. This device seems to be a battery charger, but it's been sitting here in the rain with the enclosure ripped open. This gigantic three-phase induction motor is really impressive but if you take a closer look, you can see that it was severely damaged. Here in this mess of cables and old adapters, we find two old SNES controllers. The wires need to be replaced. Not a super valuable find, but we will fix these because I really like the Super Nintendo and have fond memories of playing with it as a kid. Here we have another old school toolbox of a type that is more common in Germany than in many other countries around the world. This particular one is a little rusty though, but I have actually just bought a whole batch of similar yet much more rugged toolboxes from the German army and we will take care of those later in this video. When I first spotted this drill press, I thought this might be something. But not only is it super rusty and damaged, it's actually a cheapo brand and never had great quality in the first place. These shelves however are a really lucky find. See I've just started to rent a new storage room in a warehouse and need steel shelves to store many of my refurbished tools and other valuable things. And these shelves couldn't have come at a better time. I actually bought a few more of those as well, but more about that in just a few minutes. For the same room, I was also looking for a bench or desk of some kind. And this old workbench frame fits my needs very well. We'll buy that as well then. Another thing that I found at a scrapyard some time ago is this blue metal box here. And we will build something really useful with that in this episode. But I didn't really find any interesting electronics worth saving this time. So let's go to another place where you can sometimes find great things for a low price. A thrift store. A home for used kitchenware, books and other household equipment. This store also has a corner for used electronics and for audio equipment in particular. I actually went here several times. At my first visit I bought this cool looking Toshiba compact audio system from 1983 for 10 bucks. Then I returned and also bought this 1980s Sanyo amplifier also for 10 bucks. I then also found two really high quality CD players from Yamaha and Pioneer for a few euros each. Out of these four devices three had the tag für Bastler in German meaning not working on them and well we'll have to see about that and I'd say it's about time we return to the workshop. And let's start with something rather easy and fun, the Super Nintendo controllers. See this kinda closes the circle because in the first episode of this series we found an old SNES on one of the scrapyards but I didn't have any original controllers. Funny that now, in episode number 27, we can complete my setup. Now in case you're from the US, you might find the look of these controllers a little strange, but that's just because the NTSC and PAL versions of the Super Nintendo had a different outer appearance. Here in Germany, basically all SNES controllers looked like this. But with both of these controllers, the cables are beyond repair and one of the two is also missing the plug. After cutting off the two wires to have them out of the way, I open the enclosures. Inside we find a number of buttons and pads, all undamaged but pretty dirty, and we'll have to clean them all. The plastic casings are also very dirty as you can see. 
a cheap solution here is to simply dissolve some washing powder in warm water and let the parts sit in there for a day or so. In the meantime we can start to replace the cables. As you can see we are left here with a little plug and some of the original wiring. You can also buy dedicated replacement cables, but I don't have any of those. What I do have are two SNES controller extensions that you can get for a few bucks online. I already removed the female end and used a wire stripper on the individual leads. But apparently these third party extension wires use different colors from the original color cables. So in order to connect the right wires to each other, I first have to find out which pin of the connector leads to which color wire. You can do this with a continuity tester on a DMM for example, and you don't actually need a resistor for this. I just needed something that would fit into the contacts of this plug. And after soldering the corresponding wires to each other, I used some heat shrink to insulate all of these connections. In the next step, the parts are taken out of the washing solution and are brushed off with a brush and wiped dry with a towel. You can already see that they have become much cleaner again. To act as a kind of strain relief, I put a bigger piece of heat shrink around all wires and glued it to the back of the PCB with a bit of MS polymer before putting the enclosures back together. But do the controllers actually work? Well, they certainly do work again, but I never said I'm actually good at using them. The next scrapyard find that we will put to use is this blue box here. It used to be the enclosure for a brake test stand, but all that is left is the outer hull. I've had this lying around for a while. But always wanted to use this to solve a very annoying problem. In order to work on my many projects, I'm in constant need for materials and replacement parts. Many of those parts, however, are rare and I can't source them locally. Therefore, I have to order a lot of stuff that is then mailed here from other places in Germany and beyond. But since I'm also often on the road working and filming outside the shop, I'm often not home when the mailman comes. And years ago I saw advertisements by the postal service that said that they had developed these rather big boxes that people could maybe put in their yards or driveways so that packages could be delivered to those oversized mailboxes if the recipients weren't home. Well, I heard of that 15 years ago, but have never seen that. So I figured it was time to once again do it myself. Even though, to be fair, a friend helped me with this project. We started by trimming the hedges next to the big gate to the garden that is in front of my workshop. And after removing at least some of the old paint to prepare this thing for a new paint job, I cut out a door where small and mid-sized packages would be inserted by the mailman. We then applied primer to all outside surfaces. The top portion of the box that will be visible from outside the property was then painted yellow, which is the color of DHL and the color of public mailboxes here in Germany. I just thought that this would help to make it more visible. This part, also painted yellow, will act as the door. All other parts of the enclosure facing the property were painted in a dark green shade as to blend in with the hedges and overall appearance of the garden. And with the paint dried, we then started to install a steel back door. This is how we will get access to our packages later, of course. The front door was also installed. With the back door also painted, the new package box was ready to be installed next to the gate. For that I simply used one of the old steel posts of the fence behind the hedge. In order to make this possible, I had to cut the hedges back quite a bit. And since the leaves won't grow back over the winter, I added some tarp just as visual protection for the next few months. At this point it really was an extremely low-tech solution, with no way to lock the front door for example. 
But I figured it would be best to see if the delivery drivers and male men and women would even get how this is supposed to work before investing any more time into it. We installed this thing three weeks ago and since then numerous packages have arrived here this way. I told every delivery person I met here to please use this thing and they all loved it. I'm thinking about adding an electronic lock for the front. Maybe one that will simply lock at night just to keep things simple, you know? And maybe a padlock on the back door. The male woman from the German mail service actually filmed this thing and sent the video to her colleagues. She said DHL and Deutsche Post should have this at every house. I happen to agree. The next scrapyard find were these shelves and I already mentioned that I actually had bought additional shelves some days before. The reason is obvious. I keep repairing and building new things all the time, so they do tend to pile up. But a workshop is a place to work on projects, not to store things that will only be in your way. This had increasingly become a problem, so I have been looking for a storage room somewhere in my area. After a few weeks I found this place here that is heated, dry and safe and has an elevator. I wanted to install shelves immediately, so I got some and started to prepare them to be installed right away. Unfortunately, many of the shelves were either dirty or had damaged surfaces with rust, damaged paint jobs and corrosion. So I did what I could to wire wheel those surfaces. We then installed most of the shelves the first day and even repainted some of them shortly after. We would soon start to bring a lot of tools and other objects over here, but I also wanted to have some kind of bench or desk. In this case, not to work on it, but just to handle the objects to be stored in the shelves and to have a surface to take pictures in case I maybe want to sell something, for example. So this steel frame of a workbench that we found right next to the shelves on that scrapyard came in handy. It is not particularly rugged, but it will do the job. I still had this wooden plate lying around that would be oversized for a workbench, but pretty well suited as the base for a desk to take pictures on. So I simply fastened it to the frame with a number of bolts. But what is it exactly that I have been storing right next to this new bench? Well, you might remember that in an earlier episode some weeks ago I had presented five old toolboxes that had been formerly used by the German armed forces. I restored those boxes and also applied some of the TPAI stickers that I had designed myself. In the video I had also mentioned that I wanted to send one of the boxes to a friend in Kansas while planning to keep the others for myself because I really liked how they had turned out. But after the video had been uploaded I received numerous emails of people asking me if they could purchase one of those toolboxes and in the end I sent them all away to viewers. And since there obviously was popular demand I just did my best to get my hands on some more and again started to restore them. And now I have lots of them here, some in really great condition. But there is more. In that same video I had also shown you one of these adjustable wrenches that were made in East Germany for the East German army during the Cold War. In that case I also acquired more of them and I'm pretty sure that I have now the biggest collection of these new old stock tools anywhere. And with Christmas around the corner I figured that I might offer something for those of you who are still looking for a great present for a friend or for themselves maybe and who also want to support my channel. So here is the TPAI fan box I guess. Including one toolbox, one unused wrench, a bunch of patches and stickers plus a handwritten historic postcard from yours truly. These postcards by the way are all from East Germany, some from the days of the Cold War but others like this one are over a hundred years old. So in case you're interested in getting your hands on a bundle like that just send me an email to inventordonations at gmail.com and I'm sure we'll find a way to get this shipped to you wherever you might happen to live. But enough of that, it's time to continue with the repairs. Let us have a closer look then at the audio equipment we found at the thrift store, also known as a charity shop in German Sozialkaufhaus. While these devices may all look very similar at first glance, there are substantial differences in age, quality, usefulness and 
collector's value. I'm personally mostly interested in classic audio amplifiers and other vintage audio gear going back to at least the early 90s, but preferably the 80s or before. Amplifiers are still very useful because they can work with modern technologies. They are generally more repairable the older they are though. In terms of resale value, the technologies that have fallen out of favor most recently are the ones least desirable. In our case it would be DVD players and TV set-top boxes of various kinds. Besides those aforementioned factors, the front panel design also plays a role for me and out of all the devices in these shelves, this is definitely the most funky looking one, so I had to buy that. It is probably also the oldest device we saw here. It is a compact audio system, including a stereo amp with phono preamp, an AM FM tuner and a cassette drive. And I was able to find it in this Toshiba catalog from 1983. And Toshiba certainly made a lot of really cool looking stuff in those days. The unit is in extremely good optical condition. In order to perform some basic tests, I have hooked up two loudspeakers and an ordinary piece of wire as a makeshift antenna. Testing FM radio. I have to switch this off quickly again because otherwise I will run into copyright issues. But you can see that the radio receiver works. The amplifier works as well, both on the left and right channel. Let's test the cassette player then. So after pushing the play button we can hear a motor humming but see no rotation. This malfunction is probably why this device was labeled as not working. Let's open the enclosure then and have a look inside. Here on the right hand side we see the shielded mains transformer. Over here the bridge rectifier and power supply section. This is the heatsink of the power amplifier with the power transistors hidden underneath. Over here the back side of the cassette drive and we can already see the problem in the shape of this disintegrating drive belt. This board carries the radio receivers and here in the corner the variable capacitor. Luckily it isn't stuck and can be turned with ease. Upon removing this cover here as well, we can also have a look at the bottom of the two PCBs. The traces have a very rectangular style. This also allows us to take a look at the two complementary pairs of power transistors of the left and right channel of the power amplifier. They look fine. And I had already ordered a set of replacement belts that was available on eBay even though this is a really rare model. In the meantime I started to take care of minor optical issues like this annoying piece of tape. Please never apply tape to the front panel of anything. Your wrongdoings will be publicly televised years later and then thousands of people around the world will hate you for it. In order to get to the tape mechanism we also have to remove this front panel which is unfortunately only made from plastic and also this little metal cover here. I then unscrew this assembly but leave all electric connections intact. I'm trying to replace the belts without ripping more apart than absolutely necessary. With all the tiny springs and flimsy 40 year old plastic parts you don't want to risk doing any additional damage. There also is this tiny Bowden cable here. Its purpose is apparently to mechanically move a switch on the PCB to change between play and recording mode. And I actually detached that from the back of the drive to have a little more space to work on it. Next I unscrew this motor assembly and can start to remove the two belts attached to the motor. This flat belt is connecting it to that flywheel, while the smaller belt, or rather what's left of it, is stuck to that plastic pulley. The belt has literally turned to mush. Meanwhile the belt replacement kit has arrived. And this is not an advertisement, but I think it is amazing that I could get a belt replacement kit for this odd, almost 40 year old piece of equipment. In the next step I'm using cleaning wipes to remove the remains of that disintegrated belt. You may use isopropyl alcohol for this, but the wipes also work pretty well. I'm also taking out the flywheel and clean its surface. And after reinserting it, I'm installing two new belts here. After having done that, I'm also replacing the belt on the counter 
that also came with that kit. After this, I'm simply putting it all back together. So let's test this compact system again then. And this time we're going to circumvent potential copyright issues by playing music that I actually have the rights to by using our own little radio transmitter, so to speak, that is now coupled via Bluetooth to my phone. Okay, now let's insert a tape and simply record that signal we are transmitting to the FM tuner. And we switch the tape, rewind, and play the tape. Okay, let's take a look at that Sanyo amplifier then. And again I was able to find out the year it was made by sifting through old catalogs. I eventually found it in Sanyo's 1987-88 audio and video catalog. And this is also one of those definitive 1980s styles that some audio equipment had for a few brief years before it started to go to the more reduced or some might say boring design we have been seeing for the past 25 to 30 years. Do we live in times of cultural stagnation? Maybe it's just me getting older, but it seems the way things were designed from an aesthetic standpoint seemed very distinct throughout every decade of the second half of the 20th century, while I feel like we have been stuck with more or less boring compromises for the past 20 or so years in many regards. But hey, this is just my personal opinion. This, by the way, is a typical case uh, where compressed air will work much better than any vacuum cleaner to remove the dust. People have asked me before why I don't do this outside, you know, not blowing the dust into my workshop. Well, filming a video follows its own logic. It's dark outside and if I were to do this outside, you guys wouldn't be able to see how effective this method is in the video. And after cleaning this amp from the outside as well, I also glued the plastic panel of the equalizer section back on and we can try to just feed a signal from my computer's sound card into one of the inputs. and there simply seems to be nothing wrong with it. The reason why it was so cheap was probably that the panel had fallen off. A lucky find. The two other devices we brought home were CD players and good ones at that. And while the Yamaha player's drive didn't want to open when I tested it back at the store, it simply worked once I brought it to the shop. The Pioneer CD player, which was made in the mid 90s, simply worked. I also opened up the Yamaha unit, but couldn't find any broken parts. If you know what might have been the issue here, leave a comment below. Other than that, there really wasn't much to repair here. So as always, I hope that you liked this video and if that is the case and you want to see more reparathons in the future, then please give the video a like. If you want to support the production of future episodes more actively, consider visiting patreon.com slash tpai and become a supporter on Patreon or make a donation via PayPal. Links for that are down in the video description. See you soon.